So if someone is like me and Dan and considering getting back in the pool to race at Masters, what would be the advice you would give them? Um, well, I think doing it this year would be a good idea because there's no qualifying times. Um, and it's not that the qualifying times would be difficult, but it's the fact that you've got to go to a meet just to put times on the database before you get to, um, for example, Sheffield for the national championships. I think get it done this year. And then uh, and then you get the bug. Yeah. I mean, I can only imagine the conversation me and Scott are going to have after this. He's going to be like chirping in my ear. I think we should go. I think we should definitely go. <laughs> oh, it's going to be constant. Welcome to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, where we aim to give swimming the coverage and publicity it deserves. Every week, we celebrate the sport we love with amazing special guests and topics from around the swimming pool. And now, here are your hosts, Scott and Dan. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I hope everyone is enjoying this Jubilee Bank Holiday weekend if you're listening as this episode has gone live. And we are just a few weeks away now from a summer full of international competitions. So if you haven't subscribed to us already on YouTube, now is the time to do it as we will be releasing loads of contents based around all of those meets. But first, on this week's show, we are talking with a brilliant guest regarding Masters Swimming. Yes, welcome back everyone. Hope you all enjoyed this long bank holiday weekend. I know I will. Uh, as hopefully all of our regular listeners will know, our aims for the podcast and YouTube channel are very clear in that we want to promote swimming in everything that we do. So from elites to grassroots, from pool swimming to open water swimming and so on. So to be talking master swimming is something I'm very much looking forward to um, and believe it should be given more publicity and profile than it currently gets. Absolutely. I, I kind of hope by the end of this podcast, we're persuaded, or at least Dan is definitely persuaded to race at a master's meet very soon. Um, so joining us on this week's episode is holder of numerous British records and a world record in her age group, Helen Gorman. Helen, thank you for joining us on this episode. How are you? I'm good, thanks. And thanks for inviting me on. It's um, great to uh, have a master's swimmer on your podcast. And uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's long overdue, if I'm honest. Something we, we definitely should have targeted a long time before now. Um, we've done what a very brief podcast a while ago, kind of outlining Masters, but I'm excited to hear from an actual swimmer inside Masters about what it's all about. So I think the best place to start would actually be a bit of background. So your journey through the sport, if that's okay with you. When oh. did you get into Masters swimming and kind of what was your journey from age group swimming to that point? Um, I mean, I started off uh, in a little club in Nottingham and then swam at Nova Centurion with Bill Furness um, until I was about 27. Um, and it was actually Bill um, that would send anyone that was over 25 was more or less told that they were going to go and do the National Masters in Sheffield because it was a new pool back in those days and it was a very fast pool and it was just up the road from us and here it was if you're old enough then you're going and you've got no choice um and he actually <laughs> um sent a few of our swimmers to go and swim world masters that was there in the 90s as well i think i went to watch i remember being blown away by watching a 90 year old japanese woman swim two under fly long course which i thought was oh God, insane wow. um, and I, I i was too young at that point but i think it was um and maybe people wouldn't think that Great Britain's head coach that's had such a successful career would actually have been forcing his some of his international swimmers to go and swim masters. But I think it was a really good thing to do. And um, bless her, my mum was really not particularly excited by my swimming career, but she absolutely loved the masters. And I was lucky enough to break a world record a couple of times there in my 20s. And I think that was probably her highlight going in my rubbish little car up the M1 to Sheffield and then <laughs> actually kind of seeing something different I you know when I think you grow up as an age group swimmer and it's it's different a master's meet's very different um, so she enjoyed it and I enjoyed it so that was my introduction but um, I actually retired when I was 27 and I didn't start master's till I was 40. Oh okay. so what happened during those 13 years? Uh, I actually got pretty uh, unwell um I probably okay. trained myself into submission or underslept myself into submission by the late 20s. Um, um, I had quite a lot of um, illness issues, chronic fatigue, um, 
So I did it. I stopped swimming and I did everything else that you can possibly imagine. Um, I played water polo, I did open water. I was in a five a side team. I was absolutely useless. I played touch rugby. I tried to learn to play tennis, anything with a ball. I'm bad except water polo. I <laughs> uh, eventually kind of settled on cycling and triathlon. Um, so I did still swim a little bit. Um, I actually really loved cycling. And I think if I hadn't been a swimmer, then uh, being a breaststroker with enormous thighs, I think probably <laughs> cycling would have been the sport that I did. So um, yeah, I mean, I was racing um, most weeks in the summer. I'd go and do a 10 or 25 or 50 mile time trial after work um, and then try and get home without falling off because um, it's pretty tiring. So. Blimey. You're addicted to pain. Is that what that is? Yeah, you know what? I even <laughs> did a mountainous stage of the Tour de France and I think it was that point. It was, oh, oh. I, wow. you know, swimming, we do train a little bit like endurance athletes, it feels. We swim in the, swimming four hours a day, but... Um, when you actually go and do a hardcore endurance event, you kind of realise, mm. no, I'm a sprinter and this is just not the right event. <laughs> mm. So um, what actually brought you back to the pool then at the age of 40? How come um, you wanted to start doing Masters? Well, it's coming up to 40 and having done a couple of half Ironman races and um, working, my office is above a triathlon shop, everybody just assumed that I would enter an Ironman and I'd kind of decided that running a marathon after swimming 3.8k and cycling 180k really wasn't going to be the thing that I was going to enjoy. Um, so I'd had a look at the British Masters records and um, I kind of thought some of them were doable, some of them I didn't think were possible. Um, so Margie Kelly, who obviously Olympic uh, silver should be gold medalist, had got uh, the 100 breaststroke record in my age group at 114.2, which I remember when she did that swim and I was swimming with Bill in my 20s thinking, oh my God, I need to up my game as a 40-year-old swimming a 114.2 for 100 <laughs> breaststroke. So, um, you know, it was a, a serious time to go and try and, and chase because um, probably most of the times that I'd swum tired from all that training, uh, to turn up to things like Speedo League, as it was called in those days, I, I wasn't going quicker than 116, 117 most weekends, but it's only when I was resting I was going any quicker than that. So it was a challenge, and I kind of, um, I, I didn't expect to stick with it. I thought it was just I was going to do it for a year, try and get some records, and then go back to triathlon. But I joined a club in um, Derbyshire, I joined Long Eaton, and um, you just kind of, you meet people, don't you? And swimming really is about the people, and it's about the friendships, and for me, um, I'd been running my own company, uh, working crazy hours um, in the office till 10 at night and actually having to be at training at you know half seven, half six at night. Um, I just had more of a routine and I just felt happier. I think I just felt that was what I was best off doing. And so I stuck with it. And here I am 10 years later. That's interesting because kind of the one massive thing holding me back is I can't fit it in. I have no idea right now with, because when I was swimming at the age of like 16, school obviously finishes at like 3, 3.30. You've got that time for swimming after school. You've got nothing else going on in your life. But now I'm just like, where do I fit training to actually compete in here? So is it a case of you realized it was a goal that you wanted to get to and you just made the time? Or did you almost find that it had so much more, so many more benefits by making the time for it? Yeah, probably a bit of both. I mean, if you look at what you guys are doing, um, I imagine you put in a lot of time into research. Um, you recording these podcasts, you're um, online most days of the week, looking what's going on in the sport. Well, um, you know, I chose to spend that time in the water. And I think sometimes people will say to me, oh, you'd be a great coach. And like, actually, you know, actually, I, th I thought of that as a career possibility when I was younger, but there were very few good female coaches and no role models so mm. I always say I'd rather be in the pool than stood by the side of it um but you know it's about involvement in the sport and you guys have got that doing what, what you're doing and I think if you, you're probably spending several hours a day uh, or a weekend or whatever um doing that and I, and I think if you if you want to, to swim you can be successful off doing mm. four hours a week maybe um as long as you did four hours a week every week and you had a bit of a program of when you were going to compete, then you would swim well. It's about I consistency. Guess, yeah, it is about consistency. Yeah. Uh, I well, can we... hear Bill Furness in my ear. That's his favorite <laughs> word. Um, 
you know, it's not about going crazy and, and doing things over a short period of time. It's about consistency over a fairly long period of time. Yeah. Well, we did a lot of research, actually, and we found out that you don't actually train with a master's club. You actually train within the, the kids, let's say, of City of Cardiff. So how, how does that work? Is that from, obviously, coach's permission? or How, how does it work? Yeah. Um, well, when I got into master's swimming, I was with, with Long Eaton in Derbyshire, which is a feeder club to DaVentio XL. Um mm although they probably wouldn't call themselves a feeder club. but um, So it was a sort of slightly lower level. And the coach there, um, Spencer George, um, he very much believed that it was about whether you were fast enough, not how old you are. Um, so th- there were quite a lot of master swimmers there. And the club had quite a few British records. And there was a master squad and there was the main squad. And you had the choice based on what you wanted to commit to and how much training you wanted to do. So... I had the option to go into either squad, but I chose to go in with the age group kids. And it's a really interesting experience because, you know, you, you join a club as a new person. I, you don't really sort of say much about your background. and uh, you know, I'm not going to tell a group of 13-year-olds that I did swim for Great Britain or anything. You know, you're just going to get in and try and survive the session. And <laughs> particularly when you get into the second hour and you've got cramp in your quads and your thighs. And you, you know, mm. you've got cramp everywhere possible and you don't want to admit it. And... Um, you kind of I didn't think that I would enjoy training with 13 year old kids but actually there was some real personalities in that squad and I look back now and there was one kid I remember asking him how old he was he said I'm 13 and I was horrified but he was a kid that we used to do a lot of um, sort of land work on the side and dive straight in and straight into sprinting and back out and kind of complex kind of training like that but he would always be the kid that would go and get 10 bricks if we were supposed to swim with one and um, (laughs) then He went off and joined the parachute regiment, and you know, actually, it's quite—it's really nice just seeing them grow up. And actually, they—it just was a bit different. I, I hadn't spent time around young people really for a while, and then, you know, I'd got someone exactly the same age as me that was—I could train in the lane with her, or I, it depends what the set was. Um, a guy came over from Loughborough, a very, very good breaststroker, um, and we trained together really well for quite a few years. He got down to like a two fourteen on a 200 breaststroke, a 101. Um, and so, you know, the, you just find people to train with. And um, so I'd got to the point, I'd, um, I'd start doing, I, I live in Cardiff now and um, my partner's in Cardiff and I was planning to move down here. So I started doing a few of the Welsh meets and um, I'd go to a Welsh short course and there was one year I got uh, the 200 breast and I was got onto the podium and I'd got Chloe Tutton and... Um, Jocelyn Ulliot were the other two people and I was like you know I'm doing okay here um, <laughs> yeah and I always used to talk to Keith Bewley and I'd be like Keith I'm going to join I'm going to join I'm going to come to Cardiff and I'm going to join the club and he'd be like yeah come on and uh, occasionally I'd go in the public and he'd drag me out and say right come and swim with these kids and he'd say this is Helen she's at over 40 and she's going to kick your ass <laughs> um, and um, unfortunately Keith died before I actually plucked up the courage to go and ask Graham Wardell if I could join but um, mm. you know at that point they'd seen me at these meets so um, he just said oh mm. come and come and see how you get on so I think um, one of the biggest things for me is for master swimming almost for you to be successful you need to leave your ego at the door so you need to forget about the times you were doing when in the age group I mean this might not apply to you given that you're you're th- hitting third on Welsh podiums but is it a case of for you to enjoy the sport when you're a master swimmer? You need to for, almost treat it as a second, a second career. sport. Does that make, yeah, a second career? So you kind of forget your PBs before. Yeah, yeah, to some extent. I mean, I I, I definitely have various sets of PBs. Um, I'm I'm currently into the post COVID PBs because, um, you know, there is an inevitably an inevitability that as you get older then you are going to get slower, but it's not, you know, it's not linear. You can have a really good couple of years and you could have a really not so good couple of years. You know, you're not going to just gradually get slower and slower and slower. Um, and I have gone a couple of lifetime PBs, but yeah, I mean, I have my PBs from 20, the twenties and below, and I have my master's PBs, but you know, even now looking at a time I did in when I was 42 I'm 50 this year it's like well actually that's eight years ago we've had two years of COVID where there really wasn't much going on and I, and I, I am slower than I was and I, you have to accept that but um, 50 brushstroke 
I was never really allowed to do that when I was at Nova. Bill was like, you're a 200 breaststroker. We're not resting you for a 50, you know. I've <laughs> had dreadful starts and not great turns. And, you know, the 50 for me was just like a warm-up event when I went to whatever events I went to. But, you know, I'm swimming consistently, swimming a 34 long course for 50 breasts now, whereas I think I used to be happy when I was younger. If I went to 35, it was like, actually, for you, that's okay. And I sometimes would swim a 36, even though I actually split a 33 once on a 100. But that was a fluke. <laughs> that's, I think that's the thing I struggle with the most. I can't... I, I, I'm still in the mindset of I used to be able to do those times. Why can't I do them now? Now I know I stopped when let's just round it to 10 years. I stopped swimming 10 years ago and I still can't get over it. Is there any advice that you could give to like, how do you come overcome that? Um, I think those times are important because they are, you know, you've done those times. You, you, your body is, has done those times and that is something that you've achieved and you obviously had good technique and all the things that you needed to do the times that you did. So they are a benchmark, but I think, I think it's about being realistic and and you know if you if you did by the end of this podcast agree and sign up that you are doing national masters in Sheffield then you know you might you you're probably not going to do a PB there um in fact I probably guarantee probably that a certainty. you will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And particularly if that's your starting point after 10 years but if you say well I'm going to submit this year and I'm going to do a few other meets next year and I'm going to go back next year you will get quicker and I think there's a big enjoyment and satisfaction from that of you know, you might start on a time and, and and it gives you an idea of, oh, I messed my turn up or I breathe too much or actually I really need to just be in the water more. Whatever it is, you work on that and it, you will get faster. It's almost like being a kid again um, in some mm. respects. Do you think that's why the main age group that really people join Masters isn't straight after age group swimming? It's usually around 30s, 35, 40 do you think that's um, I mean, because they need the break? I think a break's important. I'm glad I um, went away from swimming for a while. It made, it, I came back with a different perspective and I, it did make me appreciate more what I'd achieved when I was younger. Um, mm. But I mean, it varies. I mean, you look at the, probably one of the age groups that hasn't always been as strong is sort of late 30s because that's when female swimmers are having babies. Um mm. There are quite a few exceptional people in that age group now, but um, um, it varies. And I think, you know, a master's used to be 25 plus. Uh, they then put the 18 to 24 age group in to kind of bridge that gap of people who give up. Um, national age groups, as it was called, used to stop at 18. And unless you could qualify for the British championships, you couldn't compete at a national level anymore. Um, so there are, uh, it has changed. I think um, coming out of COVID, there are a lot, I, I actually starting to feel old now. I, I used to feel like I was one of the younger ones, but there's a big influx of new people that have thought, you know what, no one's swum for 18 months, two years. I'm going to go back and see what I can do. So mm. it's really variable. And you know, people are having to work, you're saving to buy a house or you're trying to get your career going. Perhaps those are the years that you're not necessarily going to swim as much. Mm. Mm. Um, but that depends. I mean, if you're a sprinter, if you spent a lot of time in the gym and, consistently swim a few times a week then there's no reason why you can't swim fast if you're a distance swimmer then it's too bad you've got to train but um <laughs> i should duck and hide now because i'm going to get roped into swimming <laughs> <laughs> well this whole podcast will try and get me involved in masters but actually i think it should be equally me and you to be honest yeah, with you. maybe <laughs> maybe um you said to kick off the podcast that the reason your mum enjoyed master swimming was it was a different type of competition so what what do you mean by that um, it's very laid back um, and there's no marshalling. If, if you don't turn up to your block, no one cares. That's your own stupid fault. You've missed okay. your swim. Um, I did not and I think people do just wander around chatting to each other. There, there are rivalries. We all have rivalries. But um, in the main, everyone's just so excited to see each other. And um, mm. yeah, it's, it's very, it's very, it is very laid back. Um, and I think, you do get some age group meets like that but generally it's not not the same it's a very different vibe and you know you're not the spectators aren't being charged to get in you know you're not you're not getting 10 other people trying to get the same seat that you're sitting in there's <laughs> there's no one sat in behind you telling you how telling you how great their kid is or uh, you know it's just um everyone's there just to enjoy it basically so i think it is a very different vibe 
Yeah, because there's quite a few age groups, isn't there? I, I, they're all broken up by like five year segments. Yeah. Does it take a while to get through a an event like a, a weekend because of those so many age groups? Um, it can do. I mean, at national level, they've got the they've got years of data. They they know. Um, you know, you run it put through the entry software, and it tells you how long a meet's going to take. So, um, it's all decided in advance. It's capped, and if you don't enter fast enough and leave it till the last minute, you might not get into the fifty-three, for example. Um, okay. Um, I mean, the distance events are the ones that need to be managed. Um, it's different this year. You don't need to swim in Sheffield in October, which is probably it's arguably one of the best masters meets in the world, as the the nationals in Sheffield, you don't have to have a qualifying time to get in because they know people haven't been able to race. Um, mm. But ordinarily, you would have to. But that's a problem area in a distance meet because um, somebody's trying to estimate what time they're mm. going to swim and get it completely wrong. Well, you've you've <laughs> lost five minutes because somebody yeah. didn't get their time entry time right. So yeah, I mean, it, it, there is a lot of work that's going on in the background. Um, if you look at some of the sort of club events or the regional events, the regional events will be controlled as well. Club events, um, some of them have been oversubscribed. Um, in the Southeast Championships earlier this year, they just said Southeast only. If you're not from the Southeast, you can't get in. Whereas in the past, you, you could. So yeah, they do have to control it, and um, we're not seeing meets that are finishing. At midnight, with a few exceptions of um, anything organised by the European Federation, uh, they tend to not do a great job of that. (laughs) Go over, yeah, yeah. And to take part in these competitions, you need to swim for a registered club. You can't just be like me and Dan and just turn up and try. uh, In in Wales, you can turn up to the Welsh Championships um, and you can buy a temporary membership and not swim for a club. Um, But ordinarily, for most people, you've got to have your um, Home Nations Category 2 membership or whatever they're calling it now. Um, And you need to be a club member. But there are clubs that exist just in name only. And they've got people that just come together to... It's a bunch of people that swim in gyms or public. Yeah. um, And they'll perhaps get together for relays or they'll they'll compete together. And they they might not even know each other very well. so there are those types of clubs, or you can go back to your old club or whatever you want to do. But yeah, I mean, I think for someone coming in new, they, you do need to be mindful of the fact that you've got to be a registered swimmer mm. and you need to be a member of a club. Mm. Well, Masters clubs vary up and down the country. How many times a week do you train? Or how many how many times should a Masters swimmer normally train, give or take? Um, I mean, I, I guess I'm a little different just because I'm swimming with the main city of Cardiff club mm. rather than Cardiff Masters, for example. But... I mean, Cardiff Masters have four sessions a week. Um, I think one of those is an hour and a half and the others are an hour. Um, that's probably fairly typical. Some have got more. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're getting in and swimming four times a week and, and looking after yourself, you can swim well. And I imagine because of pool time, this will be quite late at night as well? Um, yes and no. Um, I mean, I swim I swim in the afternoon. I'm lucky um, in that respect. Um I actually really like swimming in the morning, but I don't, I don't think there's many masters clubs that have got morning mm. sessions. So, yeah, I mean, you're probably looking at sessions that are eight o'clock onwards. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, I, they are they are a bit later. Yeah, but as you said, there's a chance really to get creative, and you could, I don't know, like you said, set up a club in the fact that your coach would give you a session that you could go and do at your gym in your own time, and then yeah. you meet up once a week in an organised environment. Yeah. It, you yeah, could I get think- creative like that. I think there's a lot of master swimmers that are doing that. Um, and I think if you're swimming regularly um, at a certain time, at a certain place, people will join in. Um, mm. You know, you'll end up, people get talking to each other. So, yeah, you can kind of create little little groups. And um, I mean, I, me personally, I really value being in a club because I work for myself, I work from home, I don't speak to anyone all day. And actually, I really enjoy being in a club environment and having other people around me to encourage me um, and I think I'll probably always be in a club whereas other people they've got a busy job and actually they just want to swim in a lane on their own so um, yeah it's kind of you make your own whatever works for you really 
Mm. It's funny. It's funny how people do it for the social aspects when really swimming is the most or least <laughs> social because you're not speaking to anyone while you swim. It's funny that. Well, way. you have yeah. those conversations that you have in like five second blocks that take mm. an hour, <laughs> yeah. and usually yeah. they're just completely talking rubbish. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, those are the conversations that you have. They're not real conversations, but yeah, yeah. Oh. So, <laughs> in your opinion. Is there enough participation in Masters or can we get the participation up and get maybe more eyes watching it? Um, I think participation is up. Um, I mentioned earlier about some of the events that are having to restrict entries. I think um, certainly, I mean, I I do some volunteering with Swim Wales and a few years ago we were looking like, how are we going to fill this meet? Where where are we going to find extra swimmers from? Do we need to change the events list? What do we do? You know, we, do we need to get triathletes down to come and swim a 400? And now it's like, actually, no, um, this, these events um, are popular and they are filling up. Um, you know, we put into the Welsh, we created a Welsh short course meet because it hadn't been run for years. And we have 25 metre races and skins races and actually um, just looking at what people want to do. So I think participation is fine. And I think when you come to Sheffield in October... When you're both when? swimming, um, oh, I think you'll be a little bit um, amazed how many people are actually inside that that building to swim. Um, so yeah, participation isn't an issue, but um, I think kind of eyes on the sport um, are extremely low, um, and I think that's probably for a few different reasons. Partly, as you say, there's every age group from 18 to 100 or whatever. Mm. Um, actually, understanding what you're looking at. And knowing what the stories are is difficult. Um, and I think having worked for a few different governing bodies, um, the resources that they have, um, it's not a great paid job and people turn over. Um, so you work in a comms department at a governing body, you're probably not going to stay very long. So, you know, learning about the context of, you know, a 50 year old going 50 point or 58.4 friend of mine in the States went 58.4 for 100 freestyle. She's 50 years old last weekend. Um, actually, under a minute for 100 free for anyone is a good swim. But a 50-year-old woman, mm-hmm. um, you know, you've got Jane Asher. Who's nine, yeah, it's good. Yeah. You've got Jane Asher, who's 91, swimming one minute 44 for 100 freestyle. Um, and that's actually, you know, the fact that she's still able to even get on a block and compete mm-hmm. um, at age 91 Um and swim that sort of time is incredible, really. So I think you've got people like Nick Hope who worked for the BBC. He swims Masters, yeah. and I think he does a little bit just to kind of um, promote people like Jane. But I think maybe brands and um, governing bodies or maybe um, kind of publications are mm. they're missing a trick, really. Um, I do a lot of work in triathlon, mm. um, and the content that gets the biggest reach in terms of what I'm putting out quite often is uh, a story about the person that finished last or um, the guy that did an amazing performance in his 70s but looks like he's in his 50s. And um, I think if you put that content in the right place, um, the, the right people see it, then I think there is a, there is a, it's quite uplifting um, to mm, see that yeah. kind of thing. Um, you know, we're all going to age and actually seeing an uplifting story about actually this guy's in his 70s and he's just done this amazing triathlon performance and he looks fantastic. Just look at this guy. I mean, that's, that's great. Um, I think as well, um, and it was going, starting to go this way before Corona, there were the right conversations is how do we you look at an international meet? Like when Glasgow hosted European short course, you've got that time in the middle of the day when the pool's not being used. Can you put exhibition events mm-hmm. on oh, yeah. um, an event that's there purely just to break records Um Australia did it. They had a guy that was 100 um, and they wanted him to break the world record for 100 free and they they put that into their Olympic trials. Um, um, look it up on YouTube. It's incredible. Um, and so I think, you know, there are little things that can be done, but mm. you, you can't blame people in the outside world to not understand the context of Masters. Um, but I think having, you know, a few more people kind of pulling out the interesting stories, I think, perhaps people would be inspired by it well there you go there's there's one definite reason for us to go to sheffield we need to get some research and get some stories going there you go. um masters nationals is coming up is it aberdeen over the summer yeah um yeah 
Yeah, I mean, it's a track, isn't it? But um... Yeah, a little bit. I Before we ask whether you're going to go there, I was going to ask who are the people that maybe, I'm going to put you on the spot, who are the people that we maybe need to be keeping an eye on and writing some stories about? Um, well, Jane's going, Jane Asher, and she's probably the most famous master swimmer in Britain. Um, but um, because it's in Scotland, I think there'll be some Scottish swimmers. I remember it was there five years ago, I think, and um, there were some young Scottish lads that turned up and they were smashing all kinds of records because it was on, you know, it's a great pool in Aberdeen mm -hmm. and here's a meet that's got national, you know, a national tag attached to it. Um, you know, you walk in and all the national championship branding boards are up there. You know, it feels like, you know, most people don't get to go to British Summer Champs or British Champs, but actually you go to a Masters National Championships and, you know, they do pull out all the stops. It looks like a major event. So it does pull in, um, it does pull in people that are potentially going to swim quite well. But usually you're looking at who's just changed age groups. They're the ones that are, have been eyeing, you know, you wait, you wait five years, every five years, you you've got your eyes on a new set of records. So. Um, oh, I yeah, I, 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 I probably could name names, but um, I don't want to talk <laughs> off air. Off air. Yeah. <laughs> and are you looking to go? Are you looking to swim? I am going. Yeah, I've booked my flight, so I'm flying from Bristol to Aberdeen. It's not a cheap flight. I could uh, go to Lanzarote for a lot less money, but um, yeah, it's kind of you know, it's it adds to the big event feel, isn't it? I might not be uh, on the Men Ostrom tour, but I can get on an aeroplane and go to and go to a city that I've. I've only been to once before um, and you know it's a swim meet where lots of people are aiming to swim well and mm. um, you know there's permanent warm-up swim down there's you know it's mm. a nice it's a nice facility there and, and it's an opportunity to swim well. So when it comes to funding let's say is there any funding out there or have you got to fund yourself for that flight or anywhere internationally? Yeah I mean it, it is self-funded um, um, and I don't I don't think that British swimming should be funding it, to be honest. Um, you know, perhaps they should be taking a little more. Well, it wouldn't be British swimming. It would be under Swim England, Wales and Scotland. Like mm. Sometimes I wish they would do a little bit more to promote what, what we're doing. Um, and there is responsibility on us to make sure that they know what the stories are. But uh, volunteers are relied on a lot, I think. Um, yeah. So I think, that, you know, there is a little bit more that could be done there. Um, talking to publications such as yourself, um, you know, I used to write a bit for Swim Swam and I was working with them for ages to say, look, can we have a master section on on your site and I'll write content for you. But it was it was actually going pretty well. And then the coronavirus got in the way of that conversation. Yeah. So I could revisit that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you go to Worlds or Europeans, you're paying for it yourself. It's a swimming holiday and mm. um, it's up to you whether you go. Um, I did go to the last worlds in Gwangju um why else would someone go to South Korea um <laughs> and um yeah that was an expensive trip but you know what I stood on the block in lane four which is the same lane that Adam Peaty had swam mm. in a few weeks earlier and I won a world title and actually um there's quite a lot of pride that comes from that so um mm. yeah it was an experience I'm, you know, I'm not saying I'll ever go back to to Gwangju but um I'm glad that I went um there's uh, Europeans in Rome this summer. I'm not going, um, partly because they only allow you to do three events, and I'm world champion on four events, and I just don't think you can call it a championship um, uh, on that basis. And it's also very, very expensive. Um, I think a lot of people want to go to Rome. Um, mm. The Stadio Olimpico is being used. It's a great venue, but um, it's the end of August in Rome competing outdoors it could be 40 degrees you've got to spend your whole summer training i've trained all year round i kind of want to go on holiday in august um, <laughs> yeah. so. does it use does it usually follow around the the elite international meets because that's that's kind of the pattern i'm hearing there yeah it it is something that started happening a few years ago um it doesn't automatically always go to the same place um and it, ugh, i get it um a country potentially puts a lot of investment into hosting the elite worlds and then you get the bolt on of five to ten thousand masters swimmers turning up and mm. and the economic benefit of that is very good but um mm. if you look at the destinations for the next few worlds i don't think anybody's very happy about going to doha um or kazan or um you know that isn't 
it's not you know the elite swimmers don't want to go there i'm certainly not going to spend money in either of those places um uh-huh. but um I, you know i don't want to sound too negative there but i think there are really fantastic meets in britain we're very lucky um mm. um that you know the national events team that are putting on british british champs that you're seeing that's quite slick now on the live stream um mm. you know we have events that are of a similar standard and swim wales quite often put a live stream in i, I don't think i'd recommend anyone to watch a whole day of a live stream of a master's meet but you know you can go in and and watch y- your friends race or have a um, little sample yeah yeah um, but um <laughs> you know again that's down to resource isn't it if, you, if you've got um you've got 24 hours of camera footage from a meet why is someone not editing that and turning it into a highlights video i'd, well, I'd love that amount of footage at yeah. our disposal Honestly, yeah. it's like it's impossible to get hold of any pool time whatsoever. So mm. that sort of stuff would it's kind of underappreciated maybe by some people. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So if someone is like me and Dan and considering getting back in the pool to race at Masters, what would be the advice you would give them? Um, well, I think doing it this year would be a good idea because there's no qualifying times. Um, and it's not that the qualifying times would be difficult, but it's the fact that you've got to go to a meet just to put times on the database before you get to, um, for example, Sheffield for the national championships. Um, so you wouldn't have to do that this year. You could just enter. If you wait until after next year, I think the qualifying times be back. So you would have to then go and swim your club championships or you would have to go uh, to a regional or a club meet just to put times down basically to enable you to enter so it's easier this year so I think get it done this year and then uh, and then you're in once you've got time on the database it's there for a few years isn't it so and then you get the bug yeah I mean I can only imagine the conversation me and Scott are going to have after this he's going to be like chirping in my ear I think we should go I think we should definitely go (laughs) no it's going to be yeah I mean last, last year's meet was um it, it was incredible, really, because we'd all been stuck in our own houses for a long time, and suddenly you turned up to Sheffield, and there was—I don't know how many people competed, but you know there was hundreds of people there. You've got someone like Adam Barrett turning up and breaking a world mm. record. Um, you've got Loughborough University are there because it's just up the road from you know from mm. where they are. Um, a lot of really fast swims, and then you've got Jane Asher, who I think broke five world records in the ninety-plus age group, and. Um, it, you know, it's a very special environment, and everyone loves swimming in Sheffield. It's 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 one of the best pools in the world still, even though it's getting a bit old now and tired. But um, yeah, I and mean, I think the opportunity to swim there is um, is what kind of pulls people in. Mm. I haven't swum there since I was like sixteen, so perfect <laughs> <Yeah>. excuse. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, Helen, thank you so much for sharing all about master swimming on this week's podcast. Now, we do usually do some quick fire questions to end. As you are, I class master swimming as elite swimming. How does that sound for you? Uh, depends what the questions are. <laughs> oh, they should be fairly easy. They're fine. <laughs> um, what is your favourite event? Um, well, I my best event is the two hundred breaststroke and anyone that knows me knows what my car number plate is so I can't get away from it um, <laughs> um I do prefer the 100 now I think the 100 is more a balance of kind of power and speed and then um mm. being able to bring it back but uh, I, I need to remember that I am a 200 breaststroker and that is the event that uh, I'm probably best at you're tied to <laughs> yeah <laughs> um who is your swimming idol oh gosh um I'm not someone that's really into idols, um, but um, if I could be 10% as cool as Frederica Pellegrini, I'd be very happy. I like it. She is cool, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What is your proudest moment in swimming? Oh, um, I don't know if I can answer that, to be honest. I think think it's the fact that I've been in it so long and I can Mm. still do it. some of the sets that I get thrown at by, I get given by the, the card of coaches, I, I'm amazed I'm still physically capable of doing them and getting out of the pool afterwards. So, um, yeah, I think it's the kind of the length of time that I've been involved with it and I still enjoy it. That's probably. Mm. You've uh, teed up the next question quite yeah, well as well. Yeah, you said that. Yeah, yeah. What's the hardest set you've ever done in training? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> you know, when you get to my age, they kind of... They can't, coaches can't give you anything that is going to shock you anymore. 
Um, it's hard to pull one set out when you've done so many horrible sets. Um, <laughs> so I, I may be going to go just the fact that I think that we did it for seven years uh, at Nova, either 12 or 14, 200 brushstrokes, twice a week, every single week, uh, for seven years, off 305 or 310. And if it was off 310, it normally had double pullouts. Um, and we'd often be in the end lane in a horrible Victorian pool with string lane ropes and some water being blasted at us from the fan in one <laughs> end. And yeah, I think the fact that, that you just knew when you turn up on a Tuesday and a Friday that you were doing 12 200s. And if you were unlucky, it was 14. And oh my God. Yeah. It takes some mental strength to keep coming back and doing that again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Twice I a week as well. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. why I would probably say it's got to be that set because to keep going back, it's like there must be some sort of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and our newest question, courtesy of Andy Jameson, what is your pre-race song, if you have one? I don't have one. I, You know, I go to the start of an event. I've got two pairs of goggles, two swim caps, my drink, and... I don't need to be fucking around with a with my headphones, phone and yeah. earphones and yeah. It's amazing the amount of times you see swimmers on TV with headphones in before a race, or at least the camera goes to them because we've asked this question to several people recently, and no one listens to music before a race. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, sit obviously... the you sit in the core room, don't you? And um, you see the guys mainly walking out with their big chunky mm. headphones, mm. but. Um, I don't know. It's one extra thing that you've got to think about. If, what are you mm. doing with your phone? Where are you leaving it? I, I just. I remember watching a few um, live streams during COVID, and there were people forgetting to take their masks off, and we're getting on the block. So it's <laughs> another level of uh, of um, things to have with before a race. It's like I couldn't do a, a mask, a phone, headphones, two pairs of hats, the goggles, two hats. It's too much. Yeah. <laughs> and final question is uh, always a little bit left field, but. If you were to go on a road trip, there's three spaces in the car. Let's say from Cardiff to Sheffield for Masters Nationals. Who would go with you? They could be friends, family, or celebrities. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I went to university in the States. And I did some stupid road trips there. So Cardiff to Sheffield is actually quite tame. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I already mentioned her. Maybe my mum. Um, she's not alive anymore. But uh, I think I, I don't think anyone else would get in the car because she talks so much. So I think just the four <laughs> Would probably there's kind of a lot to catch up on in the last three years so i'll take my mum to nationals yeah i like it helen thank you so much for coming on to this week's episode of the propulsion swimming podcast i'm going to be badgering dan even more yeah, to will. get back yeah. training um yeah. hopefully i can transfer lake swimming into the pool again we'll see how that goes um and hopefully we'll see you at sheffield yeah hopefully i'll, I'll be badgering you on email yeah, and well, Scott's going to twist my arm. I think he's literally going to let this bit of physical stuff go on as well, no doubt. <laughs> you've, got, you've got half a relay team already, so that's true. Yeah, that's true. Scott's going to be a bit of fly, as well. I'm sure. Yeah, that's true. There you uh, go. Well, best, best of luck for Aberdeen. Thank uh, you very I know much. it's a bit, bit of a trek for you, but yeah, best of luck and uh, yeah, hopefully see you in Sheffield. Yeah, and thank you for um, allowing me to talk about Masters and, and for taking interest in it. So, no worries. Hopefully, hopefully we soon. can, yeah, hopefully we can do a bit more for Masters swimming as well in yeah. the near future. Oh. Cool. Yeah. Great. So that just about rounds up this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. And me and Dan will be back next week with a very exclusive interview. Yes, thank you for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you on the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.